we're you know excited to have our, our first fine virtual symposium on the 23rd. We have a very exciting lineup of uh, precision health speakers in multiple different domains. Um, so we really hope that everyone can join us, join us for that. Um, also, I'm sure many of you have seen the uh, Sanjeev Sam Gambir Phillips Fellowship in Precision Health Program. Um, this is our first uh, training program uh, from FIND, and we're looking forward to um, supporting fellows uh, working in uh, Department of Radiology faculty in areas of precision health and radiology. Um, just want to mention a couple upcoming seminars. Um, so we have improving abdominal aortic aneurysms detecting detection and screening, um, and also have a topic to be announced from uh, Josh Leas coming up. Um, but really excited to have everybody with us today for our, our first uh, se seminar of, of this year. And we're really uh, it's great to have. Uh, Talia Rubik is with us today. Um, give a brief background on her. Um, she's a psychiatrist, the clinical and research interests in perineal mood disorders and in the con contribution of early life experiences to adult mental health and Ill illness. She completed her MD as well as a PhD in developmental neurobiology at Columbia University's uh, medical scientist program resident and did residency training in psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine and a research fellowship in perinatal mood disorders also at Stanford. Uh, she remained on the clinical faculty at Stanford until 2019 when she accepted a position um, at Mount Sinai where she is currently associate clinical professor of psychiatry and assistant director of the women's mental health program. Uh, Dr. Robokis' uh, research interests include the effects of early life stress and disordered attachment on risk for psychiatric illness in the perineal period, on alterations in metabolism and cognition, and on psychobehavioral development and offspring. She is particularly interested in using epigenetic marks to help identify the biological pathways through which early life experiences exert their effects on outcomes in adulthood and intergenerationally. Um, so I'll turn it over now to Talia and really looking forward to hearing your talk. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you for that lovely introduction, Ryan. So I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen. Oh, no. Does that look right? Yeah, okay. Yes. Great. Uh -huh. Um, so today I wanted to talk to you about um, some work that was supported by the PHIND uh, regarding the um, effects of maternal personality and life history uh, on, um, on uh, epigenetic markers and behavioral outcomes in the infants. So I think we all probably understand that uh, early Early life uh, experiences in early life have uh, long term effects that are both physical and mental. Um, there's, I, I have a picture of Freud up here because um, I think we all owe him quite a bit for being maybe one of the first to recognize the importance of childhood events to, uh, to adult you know, function. Um, and although he probably had some of the some of the details incorrect, and, and we certainly know a lot more now, um, I think we do sort of owe him a debt of gratitude for being one of the first ones to point these out. Um, we do know a good deal more both about the psychological and behavioral effects of early life stress, but also about the physiological effects of early life stress, which include effects on uh, metabolic and uh, cardiovascular function, as well as things like uh, depression, uh, post-traumatic stress, and anxiety. Um, so I think it's important to point out that early life experiences uh, can include stressors that experience both uh, antenatally and postnatally, and this encompasses a really 
wide range of um, environmental factors, which include things like environmental stressors, um, things like uh, earthquakes or uh, other major traumatic experiences, but can also include things like uh, parental psychiatric illness or uh, unavailability and also things like uh, abuse, neglect, and institutional care. Um, so these types of experiences, they interact with an underlying uh, genetic endowment that we all have and that you know, differs you know, potentially quite radically from individual to individual. Um, and it's important to keep in mind that individual, this, you know, individual children with, with different uh, genetic backgrounds may react very differently to uh, the same given environment. So together, these underlying susceptibilities are interacting with the types of environmental influences that I mentioned um, via a number of complex biological functions, which are what I would like to find out more about and I'm going to discuss further today. And I think um, we now know that these factors uh, lead to uh, a multitude of physical and mental health differences, which include psychiatric, uh, behavioral, metabolic, cardiovascular, reproductive, and, and other types of effects. Um, I think one thing that I'd also like to point out is that this, there's, there's definitely some temporal specificity to this as well. So um, there, are, there appear to be sensitive periods for different types of uh, influences leading to other, different types of developmental outcomes. And this is also something that I think we, we know very little about and, and need to understand better. So um, we have a lot of information on human, early life stress in humans, but almost all of that information is observational, um, generally because it's not considered ethical, obviously, to randomize uh, human children to abusive circumstances. We do, however, have uh, very you know, well-controlled uh, animal data, including cross-fostering experiments um, that tell us about the impact of maternal caregiving on adult on adult behavior from these very classic studies done in the 1990s by uh, Darling Francis, Michael Meany, and others. Um, so I'm, I'm summarizing a lot of complex information in this very simple cartoon, but you know, the gist of it is that you know, if you take baby rats um, and you give them to a mother rat who is high in the grooming behaviors, then generally that baby will, rat will grow up into a uh, confident uh, exploratory a uh, highly social adult with, uh, with you know, low cortisol responses to stressors. While um, if you take a, you know, an equivalent baby rat and give it to a mother who is low on the scale of looking and grooming behaviors, the baby rat will grow up to be uh, anxious, withdrawn, and a you know, high cortisol response type of adult. I think one thing that's really important to note is that these outcomes uh, result from differences in mothers who all fall along a normal spectrum of rat maternal behavior. So uh, you don't need to see overt abuse or neglect to observe uh, shaping of the adult personality by the, by the quality of, of early care. So um, I'm interested in finding out uh, whether we can identify the earliest molecular events that predate the development of these types of lasting uh, physical and mental health outcomes uh, that are associated with uh, early life stress. Um, and so the model that um, I'm looking at is early maternal care in humans. I think we have you know, very large amounts of data from the psychology literature that confirm that maternal psychological and behavioral traits have detectable effects on the offspring development and behavior that we can observe uh, many years later. Um, I think uh, variability within the normal range, even outside of uh, overt abuse and neglect is, is important, which is something that we were able to see from the rat you know, data and um, is something that's it's possible to uh, study prospectively, um, which we obviously cannot do with uh, things like natural disasters or uh, abuse and neglect, which you know, would require obviously uh, intervention. Um, so the reasons to be interested in this type of question are that you know, 
practically, it would be great if we had better ways to identify uh, children who are at risk for adverse behavioral and physical development early. And I mean, this also kind of, you know, brings in the, you know, the orchid and dandelion a hypothesis, you know, that stipulates it, you know, based on the original, on, 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 the, on, the, on the kind of the base material that you're working with, children may be more or less susceptible to the environmental stressors. And this is something that'd be great to be able to figure out prospectively how to identify. And then in addition to that, um, identification, identification of the molecular events that underlie uh, the transmission of you know, early life experiences into, you know, lasting, uh, you know, developmental change could, could potentially guide uh, better and more informed approaches to early intervention. Um, so one of the most important means by which environmental influences can alter the uh, type, timing, and regulation of gene expression is by epigenetic effects. Um, so one of the most important epigenetic mechanisms is the addition of uh, methyl groups to cytosine guanine residues in the DNA sequence. Um, so most classically, and when this was first discovered, um, the idea was that the clustering of methyl groups in the promoter region of the gene would impede access of the transcription machinery to the promoter and therefore reduce uh, gene expression. But, and this was the, um, this was again kind of the classical mechanism that you know, was identified by uh, Michael Meany's group um, showing that uh, increased methylation of the glucocorticoid receptor, you know, based on early life stress would reduce expression of the receptor for the lifetime of the animal. Um, I think we now understand that DNA methylation can also take place at, at other points in the genome besides the promoter region, um, including many regions that are really, you know, very distant from coding regions and can have different types of effects on gene expression, which is I think still something that we have that we have much to learn about. So I, I'm interested particularly in DNA methylation because it's a way to sort of uh, broadly uh, access um, in, a, in an unbiased way uh, changes in gene expression that might uh, that might take place across you know many different uh, types of molecular pathways and thereby kind of steer us to those pathways that might be most implicated in the processes that we're trying to understand. So in terms of the, um, of the, of the maternal characteristics that we're um, exploring, so obviously there's a number of different maternal traits that one could choose. Um, in this study, I've chosen to focus on um, a psychiatric illness, uh, proxy by depressive symptoms, which is measured by the Edinburgh Postpartum Depression Scale, which has been uh, broadly validated for use in pregnant and postpartum women. Um, I'm also looking at a life history factor, which is a uh, history of uh, abuse and neglect in childhood. Um, and this is measured by the childhood um, trauma questionnaire. And then finally, I'm looking at uh, a personality trait of attachment insecurity um, which is measured by the attachment style questionnaire. Um, it is important to note that all of these characteristics are interrelated with each other. Um, and some of the other work that I've done has actually been focused on trying to disentangle the distinct contributions of each of these factors to uh, maternal and child mental health outcomes and to understand more how they're related to each other. But here I kind of want to understand how these characteristics are affecting the offspring and what is the mechanism by which that might be happening. This is, um, this is work from a previous cohort um, that I actually recruited in my, in my fellowship at Stanford many years ago now. Um, so uh, here we recruited women in pregnancy, uh, initially followed them through six months postpartum, and then were able to recontact them when their children were preschool age for uh, information development. So we gave them a, uh, a CBCL questionnaire, which was filled out by the mothers at that time. Um, and this is a plot showing the, um, the different subscales of the CBCL around the edges. Um, and so each of the, each of the colored lines uh, represent a different maternal trait. So uh, the trait of uh, 
maternal childhood trauma. So the, the childhood trauma questionnaire scale is represented by this blue ring um, and then attachment security, maternal attachment security and maternal history of mood disorder um, are represented by the orange and the gray rings respectively. Um, and then uh, around the edges are the childhood, the outcomes of the children. So um, you can see that there actually is a little bit of a, of a, of a difference. So the, the maternal trauma, the maternal attachment security and the maternal mood disorder actually were quite overlapping in terms of what types of child outcomes they were associated with. So, so these were strongest uh, on the uh, aggression, uh, externalizing, uh, inatten inattentive uh, outcomes from the CBCL. Whereas the maternal trauma factor was actually more strongly associated with some of these rather different types of outcomes like internalizing behaviors, uh, anxiety, uh, somaticizing and uh, emotional reactivity. Um, so, so we definitely could see that these quantities that we've maternal quantities that we're interested in do have uh, observable effects on children uh, some years later. And so the question is, you know, can we identify what are the molecular antecedents of this type of change? This is the design uh, for the current study. So basically women were recruited in pregnancy, um, half had history of depression. Um, they underwent um, an assessment of among many other, uh, among many other assessments, they had uh, their attachment style, uh, childhood trauma and depressive symptoms um, assessed. And then uh, when their children were six months old, uh, the, the babies provided a cheek swab for DNA um, and we also had uh, maternally reported infant behaviors at that, at that time. These are, the, these are the demographics of the study group. Uh, it is pretty well reflective of the Bay Area and of the people who volunteer for this type of study. Um, there, it's uh, heavy on uh, white people and to some extent Asians. It's uh, rather low on, on black and other. Um, and overall, there's uh, rather a high level of education. And again, that's reflective both of the Bay Area and of the type of people who uh, choose to participate in, in this type of study. Um, they did have uh, about half with a history of depression, and that was uh, intentional by recruitment. Uh, most of the most of the moms in the study were not were not depressed by interview with a six month time point. So this was the analysis plan for the for the infant DNA. Uh, so the approach here is based on the sliding windows approach, which has been previously published. Um, and this is chosen because uh, methyl groups on DNA are generally clustered together. Um, and often, uh, so you have these CPG islands, so there, you'll, you'll have you know, long stretches of the genome where there's you know, very little to no methylation, then you'll have regions that are very highly methylated. Um, and often uh, a cluster of many methyl groups like right in the same place is required for the physical function of the methylation, for example, in blocking the access of the transcription machinery to the DNA strand. So we chose to use this fact to, to kind of leverage this fact about how DNA methylation functions to reduce the, the number of hypothesis tests uh, by considering only the regions in which we had multiple contiguous methyl groups um, where methylation density was related to our uh, variables of interest. And also because the variables of interest were, were continuous, um, we did not necessarily want to have to impose like an artificial uh, dichotomous dividing line. Um, so what we did was use uh, linear regression of mean methylation density in a, in a, in a window uh, against the maternal variable of interest. So the picture here is showing um, 
two uh, sample uh, windows that were considered uh, that were considered positive that were hits and two that were that were considered negative. So, oh, so the um, so the regression also included. Uh, so you can see the covariates that were included in the regression here. So it was adjusted for, you know, the age of the child, which was you know off varied only slightly from by six from six months in most cases. Um, income, educational, gestational age delivery, the sex of the child, the mother's age, smoking status, and the race of the child. Um, and so, you know, the red example here is a region of chromosome seven, which had uh, a p-value of um, seven and 10 to the negative six, and an FPR of uh, one times 10 to the negative three. And then the yellow is another one positive, which had a p of uh, 1.25 times 10 to the negative three, and an FPR of uh, 3.3 times 10 to the negative two. And then the black and blue are samples of, of regions that were, that were not considered hits, where there was no association of the maternal trait, which in this case was uh, the trauma history with the methylation density of that particular uh, region of the genome. Um, so this is a summary of the results. So we, we found a large number. So the first column shows the number of regions in each that were associated with each of the, that were possibly associated with each of the maternal variables that we chose to examine, which are listed on the left here. Um, we looked at both depression measured in pregnancy and also depression measured at, at the six month time point, which was contemporaneous with the, with the swab that was taken from the babies. Um, the largest number of hits, so the largest number of, of regions that were, you know, that had a significant association with the maternal variable um, occurred with maternal depressive symptoms in pregnancy, uh, which is interesting. It was actually a larger number than the, than the number of hits that occurred in association with um, de maternal depressive symptoms at the time that the swab was taken. So that is, you know, sort of an, an interesting to consider in light of the, you know, prenatal programming hypothesis that uh, theorizes that, you know, antenatal exposure are also like you know, that, that, that the antenatal period is actually a critical window for uh, exposure to uh, many types of, of potential stressor. Um, so, and then the number of hits was very similar for maternal postpartum depressive symptoms and uh, maternal history of trauma, and then slightly smaller, but you know, still plenty of hits for maternal attachment and security. Um, most of the hits we found were in non-coding regions, so either um, endogenic, intronic, or a few like other non-coding, which could include like um, telomeric or, or other types of non-coding region. Um, and then the next most common was, uh, was promoter sites. Um, so it's a very interesting question. I mean, this is the large majority, pretty much of the hits were in these non-coding sites. So like, you know, a good 70% 70, 70 or so. Um, so it's, it's very interesting consider, to consider what the methylation might be doing here, but it's rather more difficult to figure out given how much less we know about, about the function of the non-coding regions than, than what we know about the coding. So, um, I later focused on analysis, you know, kind of necessarily on, on coding regions, but um, I think this is stuff that, that I would like to explore, you know, in the future, maybe when we have more of a, of a background for understanding. So the result sets are also highly overlapping, which is, you know, to some extent to be expected. Um, so this is showing again the number of regions. Um, and then how many of them were also associated with each of the other variables. So 11,000 were associated with maternal attachment insecurity of those 639 were also um, identified in association with maternal trauma where you know, by chance you would have expected an overlap of only 36. Um, 612 were also associated with depressive symptoms where you would have expected only 43 by chance. Um, and then the overlap was even greater for uh, trauma depress uh, for trauma with depressive. Um, so this is, I mean, this is consistent with the fact that these maternal traits are associated with each other. So again, like you know, trauma contributes to risk for both insecure attachment and depressive symptoms in adulthood, and 
also with the fact that these are associated with overlapping, overlapping types of behavioral outcomes in offspring. So we can see that they affect the epigenetic regulation of uh, many of, this, of the same genes. And then um, I use the, the Panther tool to identify the molecular pathways that correspond to the result sets. Um, so there were 160 pathways identified, and this is just basically showing the overlap among the pathways. And uh, so the vast majority of them con contain components that were alternatively regulated in association with, which e with each of the probe traits. So, so as you can see, the pathway overlap is actually much greater than the, than the region by region overlap. So that seems to suggest that you know, your similar cellular functions in the infants are, are likely being mobilized by exposure to each of the maternal traits. Um, but then the specific factors and the specific components of the pathways that are being mobilized may differ or the specifics of the methylation patterns may, may differ. Like, you, you know, you might have, you know, the same gene, uh, you know, activated or altered or regulated in association with each of them. And that would show up as a, as, a, as a single pathway in this analysis, but then you might have different regions, like different specific you know, regions of that gene that were regulated in association with um, each of these of these maternal antecedents. So these are the top ten molecular pathways um, that were identified to have components that were alternatively regulated in association with each of these. So um, these are the pathways, you know one to 10 that were associated with maternal trauma history. These are the ones one to 10 that were associated with maternal attachment insecurity, and then these with uh, antenatal and with postnatal depression. Um, and you can see that the, I mean, the top four at least are pretty much the same for all of them. Um, so, you know, the, by far the most activated pathway was the wind signaling pathway, which is uh, very important in developmental patterning. Um, and the largest number of hits was obtained and in, in, you know, was, was mapped to this pathway for, for each of them. And then the next three were uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone receptor pathway, um, an inflammatory pathway, which is in the number, was in the number two spot for trauma and attachment, and then the number, sorry, the number three spot, and the number four spot for depression, and then integrin signaling, which is important for cell-cell communication, and that was, you know, number four for trauma and attachment, and number three for depression. Um, and then below that, again, you're still seeing many of the same pathways, although the, uh, the their sort of, their rank order tends to get shuffled around a little bit, but again, you're seeing some of the same ones uh, show up again and again and across uh, across uh, maternal traits. Um, the specific factors that are altered within each pathway might be, might be different, but they're mapping to these same overall uh, molecular pathways. Then we've We've identified, so we were able to go from the maternal trait, which in this paradigm is constituting an environmental exposure, um, and we were able to trace that to an epigenetic signature in the infant. And so the next question is, can we now go and trace that infant methylation pattern forward to a clinically observable outcome? So we know that there is a clinically observable outcome, and we know that there is a an uh, epigenetic signature that's associated with the with the maternal trait, which constitutes the environmental exposure. Um, but you know, can we fill in that that sort of last link where we can say that the uh, the epigenetic alterations that were that we're identifying are in fact associated with you know with with the outcomes with the clinical outcome in the child. So these are the um, these are the behavioral outcomes uh, in this in this group. So these are at six months, um, and the cohort is much smaller than the one that I showed you above. So the previous cohort was I think it was uh, ninety six uh, mothers and children. Um, so the the effects were a little more pronounced. 
Um, this is just the 32 who were in the uh, in this uh, epigenetic study. Um, so the associations look a little weaker. Um, again, we're seeing this kind of interesting pattern where maternal attachment security in orange um, has, you know, a similar outcome pattern to um, to the infant behaviors that are associated with depressive symptoms in the moms. Um, maternal trauma has very little that's observable. Like most of these, you know, there's really no correlation for most of these. There was kind of a weak one for the for the empathy trait in the babies, um, which is which is quite interesting. Um, you might recall that the maternal trauma factor did have a significant result set in the preschoolers, but it was much more related to like anxious and internalizing behaviors. So there's a few possibilities. It might be that the, um, the anxious internalizing types of outcomes are less detectable in infants, or maybe just not as well detected by the scale that, that we use, which was this ITSE scale. Um, it's also possible that the effects of exposure to maternal trauma history are truly delayed and they just aren't something that shows up at this age, but, you know, maybe do show up in later childhood and, you know, and certainly in, in adulthood. Um, and then the behavioral outcomes that were strongest for uh, mood and attachment security were actually, you know, parallel to the ones that we observed for the preschoolers. So again, there was this like aggression, you know, negative emotion, um, kind of outcome and uh, the, so we don't, I mean, there's not like a one-to-one -one correlation. The subscales were, were like a little bit different. Um, so you can't, you know, you can't map the results on one to the results on the other, but um, it is interesting that this, you know, aggression uh, negativity effect showed up in, in both cohorts. Um, I mean, and I, I guess the other thing that I want to point out is that um, so the size of the result set for for trauma in this that was associated with maternal trauma in the DNA in the DNA methylation result set. So uh, maybe I'll just back up to that slide that was here, for example, um, was quite large, right? It was the largest one. It certainly wasn't smaller than the other ones, but then there was much less of an observable kind of behavioral outcome. And, you know, there might be other outcomes besides this, you know, this little set that are more associated, but it all, there also maybe is a suggestion that even when you're not yet seeing a clinically observable behavioral phenotype, there might already be some pattern of events on the molecular level that could prefigure the, what is going to become the observable clinical trait. So then, so we know that um, maternal depressive symptoms and insecure attachment can be uh, traced to um, infant, you know, negative emotions. We know that maternal depressive symptoms and insecure attachment can be associated with specific patterns of methylation in infants. Um, and the question is, you know, can we possibly sort of fill in this last step where we go, where we demonstrate an association between the methylation patterns in the infants and the clinically observable outcome. Before we can ask this question, we need to figure out what is going to go in this top box here, um, because the results here, again, are not, they're not a single quantity that we could, you know, plug into a mediation analysis, but instead what we have is a set of tens of thousands of individual results. So in order to, you know, take a first stab at this, uh, you know, I had to narrow down and select like a, a candidate gene or region to act as the independent variable in this, uh, in this investigation. So in order to do that, I, I, I decided to focus on the Wnt pathway because that was the pathway that was, you know, activated, you know, most broadly across all four result sets. Um, and then I pulled genes that had, you know, at least one or more regions that were alternatively methylated in association with all of the maternal traits that were tested. So that, that ended up being two, two genes, basically. Um, so one of them was uh, GNG8, which is 
uh, part of the uh, G protein uh, signaling um, cascade. So it's the it's like the gamma subunit of the of the of the uh, GMP, and it it acts as like a, a transducer in transmembrane signaling systems. So you have really G proteins that are signaling the outside signal and passing it on. And then the other the other gene. Uh, that was in the Wnt pathway and that had regions that were alternatively methylated in association with maternal, you know, depression, trauma, and attachment. All three um, was uh, in was related to immune function. So uh, this is a uh, this is a transcription complex that uh, goes from. So it's a it's a factor in activated T cells. So it you know plays a role in. Uh, accepting the activation, translocating to the nucleus, and then turning on inducible gene transcription during the immune response. So we're, there were three regions that were positive hits in the GNG8, and then there were, I think, like 42 of them in the, in the uh, activated T cell factor, um, of which I think 35 of those regions had reasonably good coverage in the majority of test subjects. So I had to throw out like seven regions who just didn't have good good sequencing covered. So I then went and ran uh, regressions between the DNA methylation density um, in each of the regions in each of these two factors um, and three infant outcomes which were selected because they were specifically associated with the maternal traits um, in this slide. Uh, this one, this one, and this one, and tried to associate them with DNA methylation density uh, at each of these at each of these two genes, at each region, at each uh, identified region in each of these two genes. Um, so, because there were only so the uh, so DNA methylation density in two out of the three regions in the G protein factor were associated with the empathy outcome in infants. Um, and this passed multiple test correction because there were only three regions, so it wasn't that bad. For the T cell factor, um, so I, I cut out all the negative regions just to not show you like a huge list of regions. Four out of the 35, you know, passed a, you know, a 0.05 significance bar, but then because you have like 35 of these and they don't pass the bond for any, but Interestingly, they were all in the, they were all associated with aggression and negative emotion. So there was some consistency in terms of which of the behavioral outcome each of the genes was associated with. Um, so, so basically we were then able to show at least um, as a, you know, as a proof of concept that, you know, there's a possibility of closing this loop and saying that, yes, these, um, at least some of these candidate factors that were identified in this, you know, screen for genes alternatively regulated in association with these maternal characteristics um, could then also be shown to correlate with uh, with behavioral with observable behavioral. Um, so, in conclusion, I think. Overall, we can say that uh, maternal attachment style, maternal trauma history, and maternal depressive symptoms are all associated with these very broad DNA methylation signatures across multiple biological pathways um, in detected in you know, peripheral cells from infants. Um, and most of the involved pathways were common to all of the tested maternal traits. Uh, the top four were the wind signaling pathway, which is again, you know, mostly implicated in developmental patterning, uh, the gonadal steroid uh, pathway, the integrin signaling, and then an inflammatory uh, pathway, um, which I think are all uh, pathways that we have good reason to believe would be involved in either the transmission of stress signals um, or you know health and disease. Um, and then selection of these two candidate factors from the Wnt pathway, uh, GNG8 and NFETC1, uh, they both did show DNA methylation patterns that were then associated with the infant outcomes of uh, empathy for the GNG8 factor and then aggression and negative emotion for the NFETC1 
fact, although only the GNGA passed the multiple, multiple testing direction. In terms of um, where we might go in the future with this, so I mean, I think this this question is, you know, we've I've made like a very very preliminary stab at it, but I think we would really like to know if these observable early changes in DNA methylation are able to predict uh, child outcomes like years, you know, months or years down the road. So right now we you know we have this initial six month outcome, which is great. I think it would be really wonderful to be able to, you know, follow children for whom we had the DNA methylation patterns farther out um, and find out what their behavioral outcomes look like, you know, when they're, you know, in mid childhood and adolescence um, and see if they continue to be correlated with, uh, with these DNA methylation changes that were observed in infancy. I would also very much like to get a look at some physiological outcomes, um, which I think we didn't have in this data set, but um, because early life stress is also known to be correlated with other adverse health outcomes like obesity, uh, inflammation, and susceptibility, and susceptibility to infection. These are also outcomes that I would you know, very much uh, like to investigate in future work. Um, I think ideally, I would like to find out if we can demonstrate a like a trajectory of change in in DNA methylation patterns, and in association with this trajectory of of methylation signatures with the development of physical and mental health outcomes. Another thing that I'm interested in working on in collaboration with some colleagues who are um, specialized in uh, isolating. CNS-based exosomes from peripheral samples is I think it would be really um, intriguing to be able to repeat some of this work in um, tissue from the CNS because uh, all of this has been done obviously in peripheral cells because that's what's accessible. Um, it leaves open you know, a big question about what is the relevance of a, of a peripheral tissue to a behavioral phenotype. Um, I think I, I mean, I can make arguments both for and against that, but ultimately I think, you know, being able to, to have the, have the information from, uh, from a CNS tissue would be really crucial. Um, and this is definitely something else that I um, hope to be able to bring into this space in future years. These are all of the wonderful people who made this work possible. Um, We've had uh, support and mentorship in this work from uh, Natalie Razgon, Ian Gottlieb, and Alex Furman um, at Stanford. Um, the, so most of this was done kind of as a put on to Dr. So two of Dr. Gottlieb's studies. So he sort of um, let me piggyback onto his recruitment, which is wonderful. Um, the, uh, the, um, the, the lab work was done in uh, Dr. Urban's lab. Um, and then we had help for the analysis with, from Dustin Lee at Accurate Bioscience, who I don't have a picture of. And then um, two of Dr. Gottlieb's former trainees who are now at, both at Vanderbilt um, were also like, really instrumental in, in, in making this happen. Um, funding for this was mostly from um, the PHIND. Um, I also had some funding from uh, the MCHRI and from a departmental grant. And then, as I mentioned, the recruitment was um, attached to uh, both Dr. Gottlieb's. So um, that is all I have, and I'm happy to take uh, questions if there are any. Excellent. Thanks so much, Talia. Um, yeah, so please, you know, feel free to type in your answers or, or raise your hand, and we'll be happy to call on you. Like we have a quick question right away. So Daniel, please go ahead. Yes, uh, excellent presentation. Uh, because 98% of the uh, human genome is non-coding, it's not surprising you find more methylations in the non-coding area. Did you think of correcting for methylation per uh, DNA base pair? Um, that is a good question. I do not believe that we corrected her base pair, but I would have to check in with, uh, with uh, Dr. Lee about that, because as I mentioned, I didn't, I didn't do this because it's uh, the biostats myself, but I, I don't think that would be an interesting correction to consider if you haven't done it already. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, we have another question uh, written. Um, are, the, are there epigenetic changes that result in poor physical and mental health outcomes when abuse or trauma occurs after five years of age? Um, yeah, I know, I know you mentioned this is, you know, is a, you know, the kind of the short, shorter term, like six months, but maybe you have some insights on the looking further out as well. I mean, there's definitely work uh, out there, like, um, for sure, I mean, there's been, uh, again, like, uh, work from, like, Nini and Champagne that looked like abuse, that looked at abuse in uh, victims of suicide and was actually able to get, like, you know, brain tissue and show that, you know, the glucocorticoid receptor was alternatively methylated in, in, you know, humans, adult humans who had experienced abuse versus not. So there definitely is that, you know, that kind of work out there. Um, Although uh, there's not, I mean, prospectively is, is, is rather different. And also the, I mean, that again was done some years ago when I think the field was still more in this kind of candid gene phase. And I, I think uh, we've now really moved away from that and are looking more at, you know, at, you know global kind of omics and, and you know, suites of, of factors together rather than trying to focus on individual candidates. Um, another question we have is, uh, Telomeres are related to age and are non-coding. Uh, do you have thoughts on marital age? Sorry, can you clarify that? Um, let's see. So, I, I, I think they're they're saying like if the, it, you know, does your age play a role in all of this as well? Oh, um, so in this analysis, age was like maternal age was controlled for. Um, the age range of the moms in the study is also relatively small. Like they were, you know, mostly all in their mid thirties. So, um, although we do control for for age, um, it's also not something that we would expect to, you know, it's not presenting like a large amount of variation in this cohort. Okay. Any other questions for Talia? How many is it? Is it just for this? Like, so I guess if you if you undergo a trauma, do you expect it? To, how many generations would you expect to kind of see this signature like in present? Is it, is it just one generation? Is it two generations? I'm, I'm just curious. It may be a naive question, but I'm not as familiar with this area. No, it's a great question. I mean, I, I haven't done this work myself, but uh, Rachel Yehuda at Sinai works on like, you know, transgenerational of um, transmission of uh, adversity and she has found uh, detectable effects in the you know second generation of uh, you know grandchildren of Holocaust survivors so it's definitely something that can that can cross generations excellent um, oh Daniel I think you think you're unmuted now please proceed. yes uh, my question was uh, about intervention uh, can you intervene and either change the behavioral characteristics of the children uh, and if so, have people looked at, can you change the methylation? Uh, and I was referring to a, a study from uh, Chile where they looked at uh, earthquake victims and they were able to show that those that had remedial interventions had better educational levels uh, at, at grade 10, I think it was. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think there's been uh, a ton of work on on, on intervention. And I mean, we know what a lot of, you know, the things are that we can do, like, you know, there are numerous, you know, parenting interventions that have been, you know, shown to have, you know, positive effects on uh, family dynamics. Um, I don't know that we have super long term outcomes on a lot of them. Um, but at, uh, I think, you know, the, the sort of the intervention and behavioral outcome literature is probably, you know, a little bit ahead of the, you know, molecular underpinnings literature. Um, again, there have been a couple of studies of looking at um, whether DNA methylation of candidate genes is affected by therapeutic interventions. And again, this is more like in the in the PTSD world. Um, and this is also work that, you know, Rachel Yehuda has done. But um, I mean, it has been shown that you know, again, with small cohorts and candidate genes that, you know, you know, psychological interventions for, for PTSD, like exposure therapy, can uh, sort of remediate the methylation profile again and bring it, you know, closer in line to, you know, to the control picture. So that's, that's definitely something that I'd like to look at, you know. In this that would be, that would provide a very nice biomarker for interventions. 
Uh, you may be able to find the methylation patterns in uh, white blood cells, circulating white blood cells. Yeah, a lot of people do work with leukocytes. I mean, they're a little bit of an outlier. Um, like if you compare them to other tissue types, um, they're, they have, you know, sort of unusual methylation patterns compared to uh, other types of peripheral cells. But I mean, yes, I mean, tissue, tissue type selection is, is a thorny question, but leukocytes are, are, are one, one solution that's frequently used. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And as you mentioned, that medications could have impact. I, I assume in this study, you, you kind of controlled for that as, as well. Yeah, um, so none of the, so I don't believe any of the moms in the study were taking antidepressant medication at study entry. Any other questions? Okay. Um, well, well, thanks so much, uh, Talia. This this is a very excellent talk, very interesting, and um, you know, of course, we, we we wish you were still here with us, but we're glad that we're still you know able to engage in this capacity, and you know, glad to hear you're doing well. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much for the support and for the opportunity to come and talk. All right, thanks everyone. Have a great day.